Welcome back to our lecture introduction to quantum optics. Today we want to discuss some experimental setups that people have been using to study the interaction of a single atom with a single mode radiation field. And to really give some experimental evidence, some experimental support to the theoretical discussion we've been having before. So here's again the Hamiltonian, this single mode atom light coupling Hamiltonian in rotating wave approximation that describes the coupling of our atom described by the ladder operator sigma and sigma dagger with our photonic field of the single mode radiation. And that's given by the A dagger and A light field operators. And then remember we had a coupling strength between the light field and the atom G which uh, depended on the inverse of the square root of the volume of the box we had been using to quantize the radiation field and was proportional to the dipole matrix element. So obviously what we really want if we want to study the dynamics of a single atom with a single mode radiation field we want G to be large. As large as we can get it. Why? We'll discuss that in a second because there are detrimental processes that will hinder us to observe the coherent dynamics induced by this coupling that we'd like to overcome. So we want to have G to be really really strong and really fast. So what can we do to achieve that? Well you can already see here in this picture one thing we can do that we can make the volume of the system, the box we're having, small. So make V small and that can be achieved by for example confining the light field between two mirrors and uh, these mirrors are now very closely spaced to each other. If we have like light fields on the order of optical frequencies we could just have just a few micrometer separation between those mirrors, those curved mirrors that confine the light field. And between those mirrors you can see already that's a good idea to confine the light between two mirrors because then it will be bouncing back and forth as it's reflected from those mirrors will bounce back and forth here in this so-called optical cavity. So this is an optical cavity setup where we confine the light field and by bouncing back and forth between those two mirrors it will interact very often with our two level atom. Okay, So that's what we want. We want to have this light confined between two mirrors. This defines our modes of the radiation field through the boundary conditions set by the two mirrors and we want the volume of these modes covered by these modes here. So all this here, this area here, we want that to be as small as possible to achieve the highest possible vacuum Rabi coupling that we can get. Alright, so what are these processes, these detrimental processes uh, one can look at? one has in these cavities. Well first of all we have a finite reflectivity from those mirrors. So we have a finite reflectivity leading to the light field leaking out. So imagine we would have a single mode, single photon stored in this mode of the radiation field. It's bouncing back and forth between those two mirrors. Now of course at some point that photon will leak out of the cavity and is lost in free space. Okay, at that point it cannot interact anymore with our atom which is sitting here in the center of the cavity. So obviously this finite reflectivity of those mirrors will lead to transmission losses. So these are the transmission losses of the cavity for example due to finite reflectivity of our mirrors. So obviously in order to keep those down as low as possible you want to use the best possible mirrors that you can pay for. Okay? And, uh, and the best possible mirrors that are achievable by technical limitations and uh, to have this reflectivity be as high as possible. Now then we have this scattering of the atom into free space. Okay? So our atom has spontaneous emission and we remember that this spontaneous emission occurs into all modes. Okay, So the coherent coupling between the atom and the single mode was described by our atom light Hamiltonian, single mode radiation field atom coupling Hamiltonian. But there's also of course spontaneous emission into free space. So this would be the spontaneous emission
of the atom into free space. And that's of course also bad because it means if the atom is in an excited state and it spontaneously emits a photon into free space, this atomic degree of excitation is lost into a photon that, that's not propagating in the cavity anymore and has no chance to interact with the atom again. So it's lost from our coherent dynamics. And then we have of course the coherent coupling that we described before which describes the coupling of our atom, of our two-level atom, with this single-mode radiation field. So you see, we have two competing processes that give rise to an incoherent dynamics of the atom, where the photon is lost eventually from the cavity, uh, or the atomic excitation is radiated into free space uh, such that it cannot interact anymore with the atom. So this leads to an incoherent dynamics and then we have the G which describes a coherent dynamics. And of course what we want in order to really you know, see a strong coupling of the atom to the radiation field in order to see this beautiful coherent dynamics of for example vacuum Rabi oscillations that we have been talking about is we want this G to be much larger than kappa over gamma. This is in fact often described by the so-called cooperativity parameter which is G squared over kappa gamma. So the ratio of the coherent coupling to incoherent coupling. And this cooperativity of our cavity, we want to be as large as possible. And eventually, if we're that's large as possible, then we're going to see many Rabi oscillations, vacuum Rabi oscillations, for example, before they're damped. So we have this exponential decay here in this envelope with a time constant T decay. And this decay time constant, and that's proportional to 1 over kappa plus gamma. So you want these rates, these loss rates, out of the cavity to be as small as possible. You want the photon to live as long as possible in the cavity or the atom to scatter as little out into the free space such that the atomic degree of excitation is lost and eventually G as large as possible to overcome these processes to really see many many of these oscillations before they're eventually damped out. There are many systems that people have been using in, in the interaction of a single atom with a light field to realize such setups. The simplest case we've discussed already is just take two mirrors, put an atom in between those two mirrors, and in order to have long interaction times of the radiation field with the atom, ideally you want this atom to be trapped, for example, here, or if it's flying through the cavity, you want it to be as slow as possible to have long interaction times of the cavity with your atom. Now this has been achieved, for example, in beautiful pioneering experiments by the group of Serge Roche and Herbert Walter uh, with microwave photons. And we'll discuss that in a second, why it's good to use microwave photons, why we want to do that. And to make good cavities, they basically took uh, copper mirrors, coated them with niobium, cooled this down such that the niobium turned superconducting and was essentially a super, super good mirror for microwave frequencies. And then you have a couple of wavelength separation between these of a few centimeter radiation wavelength of the microwave field. So they're really kind of macroscopic mirrors with kind of centimeter-like uh, separations. But of course, the mode volume compared to the wavelength of light is still small. So you can have a strong coupling of the radiation mode in the microwave regime to your atom. You can do this in the optical regime, we discussed that. You can also have very new experiments, for example here Rob Schölpkopf's group, uh, John Martinez's group, or Andreas Wallraff's group, who are using strip line circuits. So they're using printed circuit boards where microwaves can propagate on printed circuit boards and they can also form resonators where these microwave fields are now stored on these circuits and they can introduce artificial two-level atoms. So these are what we call an artificial atom which is again like a two-level system formed out of a complex solid-state system where you can have a large coupling of this artificial atom to the microwaves propagating in these strip-line circuit resonators.
And then you can have, for example, photonic crystal structures where you take a, for example, piece of glass and you introduce periodic holes into it and these periodic holes will form a Bragg mirror. So light will be Bragg reflected if it hits exactly that Bragg condition from these mirror structures, from these hole structures. And you see these form basically a mirror. So these arrays of holes form mirrors. This array of holes forms mirrors. So again you are back to the setup where you have two mirrors and now you put something in between your artificial atom or your real atom, whatever it is, that can now couple to the light field bouncing back and forth between those two Bragg reflectors. And then you can have even more beautiful structures, for example, like these whispering gallery mode resonators where you take a piece of glass, a small bead of glass formed by a laser pulse, which is super pure and where the light field can propagate, for example, on the rim of this glass bead. And you can see here a beautiful picture from NASA where they couple light into such a whispering gallery mode resonator and you can see the light field propagating around this glass sphere. Uh, a similar setup has been used, for example, in Kari Verhalla's group and uh, Tobias Kippenberg's group, where they use toroidal microdisc resonators. Again, that's quartz glass forming these beautiful toroidal micro resonators where the light field is propagating along the rim of this resonator, almost lossless, in a very tightly confined ring structure around here, the rim of this toroidal micro disc. Again, this is a few kind of 10 micrometer uh, size. Here a picture from Itai Shomroni from Weizmann Institute of Science who've also built these structures. And uh, you can now couple this light field, for example, to an atom that you bring close to the rim of this micro toroidal resonator. So these are some of the resonators that people have been using, but what else can we do to have strong interaction between the light field and an atom? The other thing that we can do, remember the coupling constant was not only determined by the mode volume, but also by the dipole matrix element. So if we can make D12 large, then of course we're going to have also a very large coupling between the atom and our radiation mode. And one way to do that with atoms is to take an atom, excite the outer electron to a very highly excited principal quantum number. Okay, these are so-called Rydberg atoms where one of the electrons of your atom is excited to a very outer-lying orbit of your atom. In this case, it turns out that the energy spectrum of such a single electron excited far outside the core where you have Z-1 electrons and the nucleus, so this almost looks like a single positively charged object. So this whole thing here, the electron cloud in the core plus the nucleus here has a single positive charge, remaining charge, and this outer electron is now oscillating here on this very, very big kind of radius. And this looks now like almost like a hydrogen atom and you're not surprised that in this case the energy spectrum of such Rydberg atoms actually really is just like the one of the gross structure you find for a hydrogen atom. You have the Rydberg constant divided by n squared where n is the principal quantum number we excited the electron to. Now one nice thing of these Rydberg states is if you look at their dipole moment that's huge. That scales with the square of the principal quantum number. So if you go from an n equal 5 state to an n equal 50 state with a 10 times larger principal quantum number, you can have a factor of 100 enhancement in the dipole matrix element. And that's of course huge. If you go even higher, it will be even more. And uh, that's of course also intuitive because you see this electron is now very, very loosely bound only to this core uh, of the system and is very easily susceptible to external electric fields. So we can very weak fields, very weak electric fields can already introduce a large dipole moment in the system. And the states that have been used, particularly used in the experiments of Serge Arroche, for example, in the microwave resonators are so-called circular Rydberg states where you basically go to high principal quantum numbers and you go to the maximum possible angular momentum that you can have in the system. So remember, if you have a principal quantum number, let's say n equal 50, then the maximum 
orbital angular momentum you can have is determined by the principal quantum number minus 1, so that would be 49 in this case, and the maximum projection of the angular momentum onto the uh, z-axis, that's just given by L, so that would be 49 in this case as well. And uh, this would be, let's say, our ground state, and this would be our excited state, which is now n equal 51, l equal 50, ml equal 50. And the separation here typically that one uses in the experiments uh, is around 50 gigahertz. So it's all in the microwave re regime. We have a two-level atom there. We can have an isolated transition between those two states uh, in a magnetic field, for example, or electric fields. And we can really now interact this atom, this Rydberg atom, with this giant dipole matrix element with a single mode radiation field trapped now between those superconducting niobium cavity mirrors that I introduced to you before in the last slide. So this is what we're going to make use of in the next lecture and we're actually going to see how by using these kind of microwave systems, these microwave resonators interacting with these Rydberg atoms, these two level atoms formed in these very highly excited states, how we can use that to detect a photon without actually destroying it. Thanks a lot for watching today. See you in the next class.